Very well. We'll soon be ready for our next witness. Let me just mention a couple of items uh, with respect to the, propo the uh, proposal for uh, recording these proceedings and the local rule change. Uh, all of the responses that have been received are arrayed in the jury room. Council may inspect them. I have filed those that came from organizations. These are lawyer organizations, I believe exclusively, but did not file the individual uh, comments uh, because of their uh, numerosity. Uh, but I'll be pleased to receive whatever suggestions council have with respect to how we deal with those. And with respect to a letter dated January 11 that I received from Mr. Cooper concerning uh, the uh, seating arrangement and the direction that the camera is, uh, that is focusing on counsel is pointed at, and he expressed concern that uh, he and members of his team could be observed in the background conferring. I've seen the uh, the situation now that you're seated on the other side of the table, and uh, I hope it's no disappointment to you, Mr. Cooper, but you cannot be observed. <laughs> you're out of camera range. <laughs> so you can consult with your colleagues uh, without uh, fear of being picked up on the camera. All right. Uh, Mr. Boyce, are you taking the next witness? No, Your Honor. Um, the next witness is George Chauncey. Um, he is a witness that has some issues that are particular to the city and county of San Francisco and also some issues that are broader in order to uh, make the presentation most efficient and uh, avoid having multiple lawyers examine each for separate parties. We've agreed that the council for the city and council, the county of San Francisco, will do the entire examination. That'll be fine. I assume that's without objection, Mr. No, Thompson. No objection. Yeah. All right. Uh, Ms. Stewart. Thank you, Your Honor. We would like to call the plaintiffs and the plaintiff and interveners would like to call Professor George Chauncey to the stand. George Chauncey, C H A U N C E Y. George. G Good afternoon, Professor Chauncey. You're here as an expert, and I'd like to start um, by asking you a little about the uh, source and the nature of your expertise. Would you tell us what academic degrees you hold? Uh, yes, I have a BA, MA, MPhil, and PhD in history, um, all from Yale University the PhD in 1989. What academic positions have you held? I had a one-year postdoctoral fellowship at Rutgers University, and then a one-year visiting and assistant professorship at New York University, and then I taught for 15 years at the University of Chicago. Uh, the first several years started as an assistant professor of history, and about the last 10 years was a full professor of history. And then three and a half years ago, I moved to Yale, where I'm a professor of history and American studies. Would you tell us about the books that you've authored or edited? Uh, one is called Gay New York, Gender, Urban Culture, and the Making of the Game of World, 1890 to 1940. That was published in 1994. Another is Why Marriage, The History Shaping Today's Debate Over Gay Equality. It was published in 2004. I've also uh, co-edited a book called Hidden from History, uh, which was an early collection of essays in lesbian and gay history. And I'm constantly, uh, currently uh, working on finishing um, a book uh, about post-war gay culture and politics. Um, would you also tell us a little bit about the other kinds of academic publications you have uh, authored? Um, I've published something more than a dozen articles in scholarly journals and collections. And how about conference papers? Uh, and I've given many conference papers and chaired sessions at the major professional meetings of the American Historical Association, Organization of American Historians, and 
American Studies Association and have been invited to give lectures um, across the United States, uh, in Europe, Latin America, uh, China, and uh, Australia. Have you received any awards for your scholarly work? Um, uh, Gay New York, uh, which was my dissertation, Yale, um, received two awards there. One was for the um, co-winner of the best uh, prize for best dissertation in American history, and then it won the university's top dissertation prize for a dissertation in any department. And then as a book, it won two awards from the Organization of American Historians. One was for the fir first best book in any field of history, and the other was for the best book published in the previous two years in American social history. Uh, won the Los Angeles Book Times, uh, sorry, the Los Angeles Times Book Prize and a couple of other prizes. Would you tell us a little bit about the kinds of sources that you study in the work that you do in your you know, research and writing and your teaching? Well, as a social historian, I draw um, very widely in sources. So I've looked at um, court records, police records, probation department records, records of various um, private moral reform societies, um, records of gay organizations, social service agencies. I've also looked at diaries, uh, correspondence. Um, I've interviewed, actually sort of lost track, but I think it's about 180 elderly gay men about their experiences. Um, I've also um, uh, looked at films, advertising, so forth, uh, sorts of things that I also teach uh, in, in my teaching. Of course, I assign a range of studies by historians and other scholars, and then primary documents, which would be drawn from all these fields, as well as um, films. I often teach films in my classes and teach students how to interpret them in the context of their historical period. And how about government or political materials? Uh, well, in addition to the records of the courts and the police I mentioned, I've looked at um, congressional records um, and reports. Um, publications put out by um, mayor's offices and their correspondence and so forth. Just quickly describe for the court the kinds of courses that you've taught um, summarizing given the 20-year history of your teaching. Uh, sure. Um, broadly, courses in 20th century American history, um, the broadest being a two-semester lecture course in the United States since 1919. Uh, and then more specialized courses on post-World War II American culture and society, urban history, social history, um, the history, uh, history of gender and sexuality, lesbian and gay history as a lecture course and as a seminar. Your Honor, we'd like to offer Professor Chauncey as an expert in the subjects that he just described. That is, in the history of uh, 20th century U.S. history broadly, but with specialization in gender and sexuality and the social cultural and political history of lesbian and gay men and their place in American society. Brownson? We have no objection, Your Honor. Very well. You may proceed, Ms. Stewart. Dr. Chauncey, before we go into the uh, substance of your, or the details, if you will, of your um, uh, opinions, could you just give the court a brief summary of the expert opinions that you're going to offer to the court today? Uh, well, most broadly, I guess my, my reading of the historical record is that lesbians and gay men have experienced um, widespread and acute discrimination from both public and private authorities um, over the course of the 20th century, uh, that, uh, and that has continuing um, legacies and effects. Uh, this has been manifested in um, the criminalization of sexual intimacy and association the um, uh, discrimination in uh, public accommodations and employment, censorship of images about gay people and uh, speech by gay activists, uh, stereotyping and demonization of uh, lesbians and gay men, and that all this has been drawn on and reinforced uh, sustained patterns of prejudice and hostility. I'd like to turn then to the first of those things that you mentioned, um, criminalization. Could you tell us, give me an example of one of the major ways that gay people have been criminalized? Well, the first obvious example would be sodomy laws, um, although there's a complicated history there. 
they were enacted in one form or another uh, in the early American colonies. Um, typically, they didn't specify um, homosexual conduct and only homosexual conduct, though some of the Puritan colonies in New England did actually just quote Leviticus prohibiting a man from lying with a man. Uh, but very often they um, prohibited um, a range of non procreative forms of um, sexual course um, uh, between men and men, men and women, men and animals in some cases. Uh, they also didn't uh, criminalize all forms of homosexual conduct. Uh, relatively few of them criminalized female um, interactions, for instance. Uh, but these laws were reformulated after independence, um, changed over the course of the late 19th century. Uh, they were enforced more in the colonial period and then relatively little for some period after that. Uh, enforcement increased in the late 19th century. Um, and then, even then, it, they often focused on um, uh, particular kinds of something. Certainly some people engaged in consensual homosexual relations were prosecuted, but also people, uh, they typically went after um, sex with minors, um, sex involving violence, and so forth. What, what's striking about the development of those laws over the course of the 20th century is that even though they were broadly construed, of course, they, they came to symbolize the um, criminalization of homosexual sex in particular. I mean, ironically, this is probably most striking in the Supreme Court's decision in Bowers v. Hardwick, where they were deciding about a Georgia statute which actually criminalized um, anal and oral sex between men and women, uh, heterosexual as well as homosexual, and yet they described that case uh, as if it were simply bearing on homosexual sex. And I think that broadly that's been the way that uh, sodomy has come to be understood. And of course, some of the laws did penalize just same sex. Uh, and in the 1960s and especially 70s, as um, more and more states decriminalize sodomy as part of their general reform of the moral code, they, um, uh, several states actually enacted new legislation that specified homosexual conduct, such as the Texas statute. Were there other ways besides the sodomy laws that um, gay people have been criminalized, as you've used that term? Well, um, beginning again in the late 19th century when you had the emergence of um, more highly developed uh, and more visible lesbian and gay subcultures in um, large American cities, uh, there was the stepped up policing of those um, communities and people, and uh, the police began to enforce a range of laws that didn't specifically mention homosexuality, but could be used against them. I'll just give you one example. Um, the disorderly conduct statute is, of course, a very broad rubric, could be used by the police and courts to um, penalize a wide range of behavior that they consider disorderly. Uh, and in uh, New York City, which I've studied, uh, although there are comparable laws in California, uh, we can see that these laws began to apply, be applied more and more to homosexuals, uh, the disorderly conduct statute. Um, and sorry, the disorderly conduct statute began to be applied more and more uh, to um, homosexuals. Uh, and actually, at some point, the police started registering disorderly conduct, parentheses, degenerate, um, in their own police record books. And then in 1923 or 24, the um, New York State Legislature uh, specified a, as a form of disorderly conduct one person standing about in a public place uh, for purposes of soliciting a man for unnatural um, sexual acts. Uh, and so this law then was used um, both certainly to literally criminalize one man trying to pick up another man um, to ask him to have sex, uh, but was also used uh, to um, arrest people who were found in a bar or a club or restaurant. Sometimes it was used against people who were simply found at a gay party uh, in a private home. Um, and over the course of period from 1924 until 1966, when New York's Mayor John Lindsay um, stopped the police from using entrapment to enforce this law, there were approximately 50,000 arrests under this charge. Um, and the, uh, the scale of this, I guess, came home to me when I, um, I 
at some point, I was able to, when I interviewed 75 or 100 gay men, actually counted up and realized that um, half of them had been arrested at least once on a gay-related charge in their lives. Uh, and this was the most common charge. Uh, and so it was really a very pervasive form of policing. You mentioned New York, and I take it that was just an example. What, did this happen elsewhere? Yes. Uh, there was a, a similar law uh, used in California. The Vagan Street Law was often used in California, and these sorts of laws, you know, general purpose laws, were sort of tailored to deal with homosexuals in a variety of states. What um, effects did the criminalization of gay people, of which you've given us these examples, um, have on gay people? Well, I think uh, one effect was simply to um, register uh, the society's disapproval of their behavior and make that abundantly clear. And the idea, especially this idea that sodomy laws were anti-homosexual laws, has been used in recent years to justify a range of forms of discrimination. Um, I mean, you, you couldn't let openly gay soldiers serve in the military because what they do, what defines them in some sense as being homosexual is a criminal offense. Uh, it was mobilized in some of the anti-gay rights referenda um, of recent decades. Uh, but it stood as a sign of social disapproval of homosexuals. And then, of course, it just had palpable effects on people's lives, as I've said. It meant that um, uh, a phenomenal number of people at one point or another uh, ran across the law and that they, um, they, they knew that the police were out there looking for them. Did some people, um, did it affect their willingness to, to go out and be in public? Uh, it did for some. Um, there were certainly many very bold people who went out and about, um, went to gay meeting places, uh, certainly developed gay social networks and the like. Um, but at times when there were police crackdowns, and periodically these would happen in major cities and even small towns around the country, uh, and the heat was on, as it were, um, people were then much more likely to be careful about going out and associating. I mean, there was such what a if you did get threat. arrested? Well, one of the biggest fears, disorderly conduct itself, of course, is not that significant a misdemeanor, but it, um, it, uh, it opened up much more consequential um, dangerous to people, so that um, both the lawyers I've talked with who represented men um, who had been charged this way and some of the men I've interviewed um, who faced these charges all agree that the, their first concern was that um, the fact that they've been arrested on this would lead the police to call their relatives to confirm their identity, call their landlord to confirm their um, address, call their employer to confirm their workplace. And so the biggest fear really was that this would expose them as being gay, and that that would lead to much more significant uh, social consequences, the loss of a job or a home or of uh, social respect, real ties with their family. And, and did it? lead to those kinds of losses, in fact? Uh, it certainly did sometimes, yes. You mentioned as the second topic or item um, that you were going to discuss today was discrimination is the word I think that you used. And I wondered if you could um, describe the discrimination or give some examples of the discrimination that has been portrayed on gay people. Right. I was going to uh, discuss um, discrimination in public accommodations and uh, and employment. Uh, start with public accommodations. Uh, the, probably the one of the most important um, instances of this uh, was the fact that um, in 1933, with the repeal of prohibition, first New York State and then successively many other states um, issued regulations that prohibited bars uh, from serving, uh, sorry, bars, restaurants, cabarets, or any place with a liquor license from serving drinks to lesbians or gay men or allowing them to uh, congregate on the premises. Uh, and this, um, of course, just had a profound impact on uh, lesbian and gay sociability um, for lesbians and gay men as well as for heterosexuals. Um, bars and restaurants were places to go to meet your friends, uh, to socialize. Um, but they were particularly important for lesbians and gay men because they 
had to be so careful to hide their gay identities in so many of the social settings at the workplace, often with their um, biological families, so forth, so that they were really keen to find places where they could go and be more open, um, just socialize with people of their own kind. And what it meant was that um, the criminalization meant that, A, when people went to um, a regular bar or restaurant, a normal bar or restaurant, um, they typically had to be very careful to hide the fact that they were gay for fear of being excluded. Uh, and so they often sought out um, places that had decided uh, that they could make money with this niche market, they would pay higher prices for drinks since there were so few places where they could go and be open. Um, and But those places to survive had to pay bribes to the police um, or often to organized criminal syndicates which had relationships with the police uh, or were even run by organized criminal syndicates. Um, and so that it meant that gay life was just enmeshed in a web of criminality because of the criminalization of uh, gay and lesbian sociability. Um, did did um, any of the bars sort of explicitly exclude people in light of the law, and how did they how did they do that? Well, they did it in a, a range of ways. Um, uh, certainly, um, bartenders. Uh, in a normal bar, quote unquote, um, if they realized that someone was gay, uh, could simply 86 them, as they put it, um, refuse to serve them a drink, tell them they're 86, that they had to leave the bar, which of course could be quite embarrassing. People, I've interviewed people who had that experience uh, in front of their friends uh, and found it really humiliating. Um, but then in the, um, the lesbian and gay bars themselves, uh, particularly, well, actually not just in those, um, in bars uh, in neighborhoods with a gay reputation, um, bar owners sometimes put a sign over the bar itself uh, that would say, I, I've heard various signs described and seen them in the, the literature, um, if you are gay, please stay away, or it's, it is against the law to serve homosexuals, please do not ask us to serve homosexuals. And so this conveyed a very clear message to both gay and straight customers that homosexuals were a despised category to be excluded. And they were also part of the way the bars tried to protect themselves from the police to show that they were being vigilant to exclude gay people. So how, how did the authorities enforce those laws? Well, they, um, the, the beauty of the liquor licensing and the licensing system was that it meant uh, that um, a small business owner who ran a bar had to get a license to sell, or a restaurant, a uh, cabaret had to get a license to sell liquor, and had to enforce the regulations imposed by whatever the liquor authority was, and knew that he or she always risked losing that license and really losing that investment if the liquor authority realized that they were not enforcing those regulations. So first of all, the licensing system itself meant that every single bar had a staff that was trying to make sure the bar wouldn't get in trouble. But secondly, uh, local patrolmen could step in and periodically, regularly would just sort of look in, see what was happening in their place, make sure it wasn't disorderly. And then the liquor authorities themselves had a staff of special investigators who would go um, undercover into restaurants and bars and so forth and just make sure that a range of regulations were being followed, including the prohibition against serving homosexuals. They then, if they saw them, would report this, um, and this could lead to the closure of a, of a place. Did um, other authorities besides the police, or the local police, or the um, liquor authorities um, get involved in that policing effort? Well, um, bars that were close to military bases, uh, and certainly in the big cities of uh, disembarkation during the war, um, were also put under surveillance by a sort of coalition task, for a task force of uh, military of officials and police officials, because the military was quite keen to make sure that its soldiers and sailors weren't going to such places. So they um, joined with the police in investigating them had their off-limits list, tried to get places closed, uh, so other forces were brought in. So 
if you were a police officer and you were enforcing this effort or a military person, how did you know the bar was serving gay people? Well, uh, it's a good question. Uh, there were two um, major techniques used. Um, one was uh, to um, uh, record, um, take note of um, an act of one man picking up another man, um, and it usually was men in this case, um, since that was a sure sign that homosexuals were there. So what uh, the police and the locatory agents um, did uh, often was to send plainclothes um, policemen into the bars who would strike up conversations with customers, lead them on, uh, and then at some point when an invitation was issued to leave the bar and go home, um, bring out the handcuffs and arrest them. So that would lead to the arrest of the um, bar goer, and it would also be um, the best proof possible that homosexuals were at the bar, uh, and so it would then be reported, and that would lead to proceedings to revoke the uh, liquor license. Um, the other way that was used, uh, and I've seen this in um, a bunch of uh, court records where a bar has resisted, has tried to challenge the revocation of its license, uh, the police would actually point to um, stereotypical gender behavior uh, or cross-gender cross behavior uh, that was associated with lesbian and gay men and use that as evidence that a bar uh, was patronized by them. So, for instance, um, a police woman might report that she'd seen two women dancing together, or women with short hair, or women who were wearing some articles of masculine clothing, or women who seemed to stagger, swagger around a bar in a way that w was more masculine than a woman should walk. Um, or likewise, uh, they point to men whose clothing was just a little too unconventional, a little too colorful, um, whose hair was too long, um, who addressed each other in effeminate ways. Um, the most startling example to me was for, uh, uh, one of the signs the police officer gave was that a bar was gay is that he'd overheard two men talking about the opera, something that no real man would do in the 1950s. Um, and so uh, there were just a, a range of um, uh, uh, ways that sort of um, unconventional behavior, uh, gender behavior, stereotypically associated with lesbians and gay men was used to identify them. And I, I think it's actually a kind of uh, striking thing because it's, it's one of the clearest examples of how the policing of homosexuality has often been used in a very specific legal sense and then broadly and more culturally to um, police gender norms. Um, so that actually people who went into bars who behaved in unconventional ways, um, cross-gendered ways, could be suspected of being homosexual and a bar might push them out for that very reason. Did, did any of the bars or restaurants who, um, where, where the liquor authorities tried to enforce the law resist or you know, endeavor to fight the charge? Uh, yes. Um, some did. I, I'd, I'd have to say that most just closed quietly because they realized that they weren't going to be able to, to beat this uh, charge. But um, many did try um, either by appealing to the liquor authority itself or by going to the courts. The usually the first line of defense was simply that they didn't know and they couldn't be expected to know that there were um, gay people there thus the signs, it's against the law, you know, don't, don't um, ask us to break the law. Uh, but periodically, um, people did pose a challenge to the idea of this law, that you could actually discriminate against a class of people on the basis of their homosexual status. And in both New York State and in California in the 1950s, um, there were rulings by the state's highest court that uh, you could, uh, that invalidated that kind of discrimination. Um, so it was a famous case in California, the Black Cat Cafe here in San Francisco, which lost its license, I think around 1949, and filed a suit. And we got a state Supreme Court ruling in 51 that said actually you couldn't discriminate in this way. And then for several years, um, there was relative peace and quiet for bars in San Francisco. 
Uh, and then the San Francisco Police Department started a sort of campaign against homosexuals, 54, 55, um, sweeps of streets and parks, uh, crackdown on bars. In 55, the state legislature um, circumvented that ruling by passing a law that um, outlawed um, bars or restaurants that became what it called resorts for sex perverts. And uh, the Alcoholic Beverage Commission, which was just established, then launched a campaign against um, such uh, bars and restaurants, which led to many more being closed. Finally, there was another state Supreme Court ruling that said, no, actually, they meant it. You couldn't do this. Um, and uh, nonetheless, uh, Mayor George Christopher here in San Francisco had had a tough re-election campaign in 59, and his opponent had charged that he had allowed San Francisco to become a mecca for homosexuals. And he was so uh, determined to show that that wasn't true that once he was re-elected, he launched a two-year-long campaign against um, uh, gay life in the city, which led to, uh, by one historian's count, 40 to 60 arrests a week and about a third of the bars being shut down. So after, the, after the Supreme Court? After, after this ruling. And after that, things slowed down in San Francisco, but there continued to be such raids in Los Angeles. So when did these um, sort of bar raids and, you know, this kind of activity end? Well, they, um, they continued uh, uh, periodically, even in places where they had been ruled um, unconstitutional. Most famously, of course, uh, in 1969, the police raided the Stonewall Bar in, in Greenwich Village in New York um, after, in fact, the courts had already ruled that uh, it was legitimate to serve uh, lesbians and gay men, um, though in that case they were going after mob-oriented bars. Uh, these uh, uh, raids periodically happened, um, certainly in San Francisco and L.A. into the 60s and 70s, as I said, later in LA and actually last summer in Fort Worth, Texas, um, the police went to a bar and arrested seven of the patrons and there was quite a controversy about that. I mean, so obviously the number of such events has dramatically fallen off, but it happened at very different rates across the country. So can you describe the effects of that practice of um, basically shutting down places where gay people gathered on gay people? Um, well, it, it just meant, again, that um, they had, it was one more way it was conveyed to them that they were a despised class of people and a group of outlaws in the eyes of the law, and that they had to take great care in protecting or uh, keeping secret the fact that they were gay. Uh, and I, I think uh, I may have said this already, but it, it, it sort of more broadly helped um, not just for gay people, but for sort of in the public at large associated gay life with criminality. There were periodically um, uh, campaigns against gay bars, uh, and they often talked about the police corruption that was required to keep these bars um, going. And uh, instead of pointing to the criminalization of them as the predicate of that, they talked about gay bars as corruptors of the police. Uh, and it, it contributed to the growing sense on part of many people that uh, gay people were dangerous and a part of the seedy, um, violent criminal underworld. So earlier, you mentioned you were also going to talk about employment discrimination and give us some examples of that. Can you um, turn to that subject now? Sure. Um, I guess the first striking example I'd mentioned was in the military itself. Um, uh, there had been various regulations affecting um, homosexual conduct and homosexuals in the military before the Second World War, but it was really at the beginning of the Second World War that for the first time, um, facing the necessity of mobilizing literally millions of people very quickly to fight the war, that the military decided to absolutely exclude all homosexuals and to institute screening procedures that would keep homosexuals out. And so this became a part of the induction process or the screening process for everyone who was um, volunteered or drafted to serve in the war. Um, 
Not surprisingly, they didn't ferret out many people despite this policy. I think it was only five or 6,000. Um, you know, most um, young gay people like their heterosexual peers were deeply um, concerned to defend the country in the face of Japanese and German uh, attacks. And they, um, so that they, you know, found ways. They were quite accustomed at this point to finding how to pass a straight. Uh, so they got passed through. And then, of course, people in smaller towns were um, afraid that if their selective service board learned that they were gay, word would spread very quickly to their families um, and neighbors um, about this. And so they were very concerned to keep that hidden. Um, but the military um, uh, was sort of aware of this, and so it had various procedures in place to try to discover homosexuals and uh, discharged homosexuals during the war. And actually, the discharges increased during the period of demobilization right at the end of the war when the manpower needs were not quite so pressing. Uh, and this regulation, um, well, in one form or another, has continued to the present day. So what happened to soldiers who had served but were discharged at some point along the way for being gay? Well, uh, first, of course, they faced the stigma of not serving their country, those who were not allowed into the military. Uh, if you were a man of a certain age and you weren't in the military or a critical defense industry, people really had questions about why you weren't. Um, and so this was really humiliating to people. Uh, and then people who were um, either kept out or were discharged, actually including people who had served in combat who were discharged, uh, were then denied benefits under the GI Bill after the end of the war. And of course, the GI Bill was just a phenomenally important piece of social engineering uh, in the post-war years. Uh, it gave virtually an entire generation of young men um, privileged access to education, uh, financial support for continuing their education, preferential access to jobs, help in buying a home. A lot of the post-war suburban building boom was financed through the GI Bill. Um, it, it had profound consequences, and it meant that um, homosexuals who were uh, kept out of the military or discharged on as homosexuals were prohibited from getting those benefits. And so in many ways, sort of kept from that sort of citizenship right. And what about the, the several thousand that were ferreted out, I think is the word you used. Um, I know you mentioned that they could be found out by family members or, or people in their towns. But did it affect their ability to you know, sort of participate as Americans in any way in our society? Well, you know, at the sort of um, most uh, basic practical letter, uh, level uh, in the early days, especially after the war, people wanted to see your discharge papers when they were going to hire you very often, and they'd see that's what you were discharged for, and that was not a good thing if you were looking for a job. Um, you know, I think in, in a way it also had a sort of very um, well, and it certainly impressed upon people that they were being denied their membership in the community and their citizenship, really. Um, and I, I think in some way it really conveyed that to the whole country. I mean, the war was such an important moment in bringing people together um, and bringing together people who'd been really divided during the First World War. Uh, there'd been a lot of demonization of Catholics and during the war and a lot of anti-Semitism. Um, and the First World War, that is. And the Second World War really brought those people together. I mean, you think of the kind of classic movies that come out of World War II where you've got the, um, the Jew from Brooklyn and the Irish guy from Chicago and the Italian from San Francisco. And, and homosexuals were not a part of that group. There was a really profound way in which gay people were being or culture, excluded from the cultural image of the nation. And you said, I think, earlier that it, um, the policy has continued in one way or another to this day. But I wonder if you could explain um, what Don't Ask, Don't Tell uh, what that policy did? Well, of course, um, President Clinton as a candidate had um, promised to um, uh, repeal the prohibition on lesbians and gay men serving in the military. And then when he assumed the presidency, there was such a firestorm of opposition to that 
on the part of the leadership of the military and grassroots groups across the country that he retreated from that and um, produced a, a, a compromise, don't ask, don't tell, which uh, theoretically said that so long as gay people didn't tell the fact that they were gay, the military wouldn't go around anymore asking if they were. Um, in fact, it didn't quite work out that way. People um, uh, were um, found out and um, uh, something like uh, about 9,500 people were discharged in the first decade of the policy of don't ask, don't tell. Um, were there, well, let me just ask it this way. What were the effects on the country of its exclusion of gay people from military service, either more recently or in the past? Well, as a number of people pointed out, um, it, uh, it meant that the country lost the services of patriotic citizens who wanted to join in the country's defense. Uh, and so, the, um, uh, you know, in some cases, those were quite important um, services. There's been a lot of attention given recently to a number of people who've been discharged who uh, were translators of Arabic, um, something pretty important uh, right now. Uh, but broadly, it meant that the country lost the services of uh, uh, large groups of people and, um, uh, and had the financial cost associated with that of find, recruiting people to take their place um, and, re and training the people to take their place. Um, I'd like to ask you now to look at the plaintiff's exhibit that's marked 872 in your binder, uh, if you would. Would that be this binder? Um, I think it would no, be the large binder. No, this is Cott's direct binder. <laughs> um, no, this is, these are Nancy Cott's binders. Uh -oh. Have we given the court? Sorry, Your Honor. This is PX 872? Yes, Your Honor. Eight seven two. Uh in the thin one or the, the in the fat binder. Dr. Chauncey, are you familiar with this report? Yes, this is a report by the U.S. Government Accountability Office um, to congressional requesters, and it's titled Military, Military Personnel, Financial Cost and Loss of Critical Skills Due to the Department of Defense's Homosexual Conduct Policy Cannot Be Completely Estimated. Um, have you reviewed this report? I have looked at this report. Does this report indicate at least some of the costs um, that the military incurred um, by virtue of the Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy? Uh, yes. It um, estimates that um, over the first 10-year period of the enforcement of that policy, um, they estimate that it may have cost the Defense Department about $95 million. Um, in 2004 dollars to recruit replacements for service members uh, separated under the policy, and then they estimated it cost it, it cost approximately another 95 million to train their replacements. Um, Your Honor, I'd like to move this document into evidence. No objection, Your Honor. 872 will be admitted. So, Professor Chauncey, besides the discrimination in employment in, in the military, um, was there other employment discrimination, or can you give another example of employment discrimination that was significant um, in our country's history? Well, after the Second World War, um, the employment of homosexuals in uh, the civilian sectors of federal employment um, also became a major issue. Uh, and in 1950, Senator Joseph McCarthy um, announced that he uh, knew the names not only or had a list of names of not only of communists and State Department and other agencies, but of um, sex perverts. Uh, this led to a couple of congressional committees investigating this charge, um, and one of them, uh, standing committee, a subcommittee, which uh, produced a report called On the Employment of Homosexuals and Other Sex Perverts in Government. 
1950. Uh, and this report um, surveyed, uh, it was based on an investigation of the way the government was dealing with this problem uh, and uh, took note of the fact that uh, checking civil service commission records, uh, they'd found that census had become more of an issue in 1947, uh, in the two and a half years that they looked at. Um, some 1,700 people had been uh, prohibited from getting civilian jobs because it had been discovered that they were homosexual. Uh, they were concerned that the procedures for um, identifying homosexuals were inadequate uh, and uh, for ferreting them out and discharging them, so they recommended a tightening of procedures. Um, and in 1953, shortly after Dwight Eisenhower became president, uh, one of his first executive orders um, uh, uh, decreed that uh, uh, civilian, uh, that homosexuals would be prohibited from civilian as well as military employment in the federal government. And it actually also required um, private companies which had contracts with the government to ferret out and fire their homosexual employees. When, um, well, first let me ask you, how did the um, McCarthy Senate's treatment of uh, gay people in uh, their investigation compared to their treatment of communists? Um, well, they, uh, they gave a lot of attention, of course, to communists and were quite concerned about communist infiltration uh, into the State Department in particular and um, other agencies of the government. But the um, historian who's done the close study of this policy estimates that uh, at the height of the McCarthy period in the 1950s, the State Department actually dismissed more suspected homosexuals than communists. I'd like to ask you, Dr. Chauncey, to look at um, Plaintiff's Exhibit 2337. I think it's uh, towards the end of your binder. Can you identify that exhibit for the court? Uh, 2337. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, yes, this is the report I mentioned, uh, Employment of Homosexuals and Other Sex Perverts in Government. Your Honor, I'd like to move this document into evidence. No objection, Your Honor. 20, 2337 is admitted. Um, turning for a minute to the, we'll, we'll come back to that one at a later point, um, but I wanted to turn to President Eisenhower's executive order. Um, I think you said it required that um, employees who uh, were in the federal government who were found to be gay would be discharged. And I, I think, if, did I understand also not hiring? Right. When did that policy end? Um, that policy ended um, for most federal agencies in um, 1975 when President Carter um, rescinded that policy, though uh, it continued to uh, be in effect for some of the highly sensitive um, intelligence agencies and so forth. And then it was only in the 1990s that President Clinton both ended the um, uh, that policy bearing on intelligence agencies and also um, prohibited discrimination in federal employment. Um, can you can you explain the difference between what President Carter did and what I mean besides or, the, right. the scope? Right. So basically, um, President Carter said that um, federal agencies were no longer required to dismiss their homosexual employees or keep homosexuals from their employment. Um, and then President uh, Clinton uh, enacted an anti-discrimination or anti-discrimination order that, that they could not discriminate. So in that intervening period, agencies were not required to discriminate, but they could discriminate. Was the discrimination in public employment limited to the federal government? Um, no, there, uh, across the country, uh, state governments uh, took up this issue and in a variety of ways uh, tried to institutionalize um, employment discrimination against lesbians and gay men. Um, 
Let's just give you one example. Um, in, in the late 50s, uh, the Florida State Legislature had a legislative investigative investigation committee which launched an investigation of homosexuals uh, in the state university system, uh, which eventually led to the firing of more than a dozen members of the faculty and other staff, and I think more than 300 people were interrogated over the course of that investigation, which lasted several years. Uh, and so there were um, a variety of ways there were this sort of campaign was carried on at the state level. Uh, and at the city level, I mean, I, I've seen in my own research that, for instance, the welfare department in New York City had to fire several of its um, welfare workers uh, in the 1950s when it uh, brought to their attention that they'd been discovered as being gay. Did the, the mandated discrimination in the federal government or other government um, affect access to jobs for gay people in the private sector? Well, um, as I said, uh, uh, President Eisenhower's executive order required uh, private companies with government contracts to fare down and fire their uh, homosexual employees. I, I'd say that more broadly, though, um, uh, gay people faced uh, customary discrimination in a range of, um, from a range of employers. Uh, and so uh, it was... Now this, the degree of this, the enforcement of this varied from occupation to occupation and company to company, but certainly um, most people realized that they had to be very careful to hide their homosexuality at the workplace for fear of losing their jobs. Did employment discrimination in, in any sector, private, public, um, federal, state, what have you, limit gay people's job choices or, or channel them into particular professions? Well, of course, we have no real statistical evidence to base this on. Um, but I, I would say that based on the interviews I've done, that um, certainly there were a, a good number of gay people who s took the risk and pursued the profession that they wanted or the line of work they wanted. and did what they need to, needed to to hide their identities at work. Um, but there were also a good number of people who uh, just didn't want to risk that uh, and didn't want to have to put up with that. And so, um, in effect, sort of funneled into the kinds of low-status jobs where people were less likely to care that they were gay. I mean, some of them are sort of stereotypically associated with gay people even today. But um, being a waiter, being a hairdresser, being, you know, taking on being a low-level clerical worker, kinds of niches in, in the employment sector where people felt that they would be somewhat safer. So what were the effects of this widespread discrimination in employment on gay people generally? Well, um, I, mean, I guess I, I have to say that uh, broadly uh, it meant that gay life really was pushed underground, indeed, sort of everything I've described so far. Um, and uh, I, I think some people interpret that to mean that there was very little organized gay life at all, and that's simply not the case. There, in fact, were meeting places. There were parties in private apartments. Um, people did have a social, gay social life. Uh, but they had to be very, very careful to hide it. Uh, and although this had already been true earlier in the 20th century, most people didn't want to take this risk, um, it really increased the stakes for people. Uh, and so it meant that they, um, they really came a sort of world within a world that was very secretive, had its own codes um, so that people could talk with one another uh, without alerting outsiders. I mean, actually, the word gay itself is probably the best example of this. Gay liberationists in the 1970s were determined to bring gay people out of the closet. Um, and so they used, they called themselves gay liberationists. But in the 1940s and 50s and early 60s, very few straight people realized that gay people, homosexuals, had given gay a sort of homosexual meaning. So that a, a lesbian standing at the office water cooler could say to another woman that she'd gone to a gay place the night before, had a gay time, or met a gay gal, and really communicate quite a lot to the person she was talking to without worrying that someone next to her would overhear this and understand what was going on. But it just meant that there was a, a level of secrecy required. And of course, this also meant that fewer heterosexuals, or relatively few heterosexuals, thought that they knew gay people. 
And in the context of that, as a variety of studies have shown, sort of ignorance, lack of contact with people is, increases prejudice. And so it's easier for demonic stereotypes to develop of gay people, given the degree that the real living gay people had to be so careful to hide themselves. Um, did the, or I should say, has the discrimination in employment at, in, the, in the state and local public arena ended? Uh, no, it, it's, it's not ended. Uh, it's, um, you know, certainly I, I, I think it's, it's clear that it has lessened um, since the 1950s. Um, and uh, there have been a series of laws passed at the local and state level uh, that um, prohibit such discrimination, though there are a lot of complaints of such discrimination brought under those laws. Uh, but there's still, um, I believe these are the right figures, um, 20 states that do not prohibit discrimination um, in uh, public employment and another tw and, and 28 that don't prohibit it in private employment. The third area that you mentioned you would talk about today um, was censorship. And I'm wondering if you um, could explain what you mean when you said that gay people have been subject to censorship. Well, um, one of the most significant examples of this uh, would be the uh, censorship or the representation of homosexuality in the movies. Um, in the early 30s, there was a mass censorship campaign led by a group called the Legion of Decency, led by Catholic leaders with Jewish and Protestant support, which was concerned about what they considered to be the immorality of Hollywood films. This is, of course, very early in the history of, of, of Hollywood and film industry. Uh, and so they um, pressured the, um, the uh, Hollywood studios to enact some sort of censorship code, which it eventually did in order to try to forestall federal censorship. Uh, and then in 1934, under more pressure, they really started enforcing this code uh, the, with the Production Code Authority. And this um, code um, imposed certain rules on how certain delicate issues would be dealt with, um, crime, adultery. These could be represented, but in you know, certain ways, usually uh, crime had to pay, et cetera. Um, the offender had needed to be punished. Um, but there were certain things that they prohibited from in being included on, in the movies at all. Uh, for instance, interracial relationships were absolutely forbidden. Um, for being represented, and lesbian and gay characters or the discussion of homosexuality or even as the code put it, the inference of sex perversion was prohibited. Uh, so that this meant that for you know, a generation until the code began to fall apart in the late 50s and early 60s, um, Hollywood films, uh, the dominant medium of the mid 20th century, uh, could not include gay characters, could not explore gay lives. Um, you, you mentioned that the code was enforced, uh, or we got more enforced, I think you said, in 1934. Um, how, how was it enforced? Uh, the Hollywood studios were required to submit their scripts to the production code uh, uh, administration, the Hayes office, uh, which would review the scripts and bring to their attention um, anything that they thought was problematic. And so there would often be a back and forth. I've read some of these exchanges uh, back and forth between the studios and the uh, production code about exactly what could or could not be included. So it, was, it, it wasn't just a kind of general informal regulation. It was very strictly um, managed. Did the Hayes Code affect television? Uh, the Hayes Code itself didn't. Um, but in some ways, there was even more concern about television in its early years. And I think uh, television expanded very rapidly uh, into American homes in the early 1950s. But in those days, way before cable, um, there were you know, only a handful of networks. Most people had access to just two or three stations. So there was a lot of concern about what it meant to bring that into the home where children might see things that parents wouldn't necessarily be able to supervise. So the, the television networks were actually much more constrained uh, than um, even Hollywood in dealing with certain issues. So that um, they were very few, very few um, characters who could even be hinted at as being gay. Um, 
uh, and the first several decades of television. And, um, you know, there, there began to be, uh, certainly there were some, and some discussion on homosexuality that inc began to increase in the, um, well, really just in the 1980s. Uh, and uh, as recently as um, 1989, so just over 20 years ago, um, a very popular TV series called 30-something um, did actually have a scene written in where it which showed um, two men in bed together with the sheets pulled up to here for about 15 seconds. And this was so shocking that um, various um, uh, religious, conservative religious organizations organized boycott threats. Uh, and the sponsors withdrew from that segment, uh, and a lot of local affiliates either didn't show at all or bumped it out of prime time to midnight. And that sort of briefly put a chilling effect um, on um, the inclusion of gay characters. But by the mid-90s, the numbers had begun to increase. Um, and uh, when it was as recently as 1996, when it was so astonishing that Ellen DeGeneres would come out as a lesbian, as a character on her show, and as a person that had put her on the cover of Time magazine. Uh, this idea was just so stunning. It's, it's, it's almost, for the young people who might hear this, probably impossible to believe that this was the case. But this is sort of the way that for several generations of people just did not have gay characters in the major medium, uh, media of their culture. So how did that affect them? How did how did the censorship of gay people out of the movies and television affect affect them? Well, it um, you know it it certainly meant that um, uh, many young people growing up, um, young gay people, had no idea that there were other people like themselves in the world um, uh, who didn't see it in their families and uh, their. Uh, schools and neighbors and, and didn't see it uh, in the media. Um, it meant that um, older gay people didn't see themselves represented in the films and were once again reminded of the fact that they were a despised category to be excluded from the dominant media of the culture. And of course, some directors, some actors used codes to try to suggest homosexuality, gay characters and themes. and in films especially, uh, so sophisticated people could read those codes and maybe get a guess of what was going on. But it meant that for most people, uh, just gay people were not a part of the, the media landscape, were not a part of the world that they knew. So not only were they unlikely to realize that they knew gay people because the people in their lives were so careful to hide themselves, but also they didn't have other ways on, on the screen to learn anything about gay life. and. You know, in that context, again, it was easier for um, more uh, frightening stereotypes to emerge. So the fourth area that you mentioned you would give some examples of, um, I think you called it demonization or stigmatization. Um, so what did you mean when you said that gay people have been demonized or stereotyped or stigmatized? Well, um, like most outsider groups, there have been st stereotypes associated with uh, gay people. And um, certainly in the case of gay people as a really despised group, um, uh, a range of groups have, have worked together to, uh, I don't know, I mean in a coordinated way, but have uh, cumulatively served to develop stereotypical images of gay people. Uh, and certainly um, many clergy uh, and churches considered homosexuality to be a sin and preached against homosexuality, so people heard those sermons. Uh, and then, in, especially in the last generation, have led campaigns against gay rights. Um, uh, doctors uh, began to pay attention to questions of sex perversion in a uh, more sustained way in the late 19th century. And um, sort of from the beginning, assumed this, most of them assumed this to be a pathology. Uh, and they reinforced a range of stereotypes associated with gay people. Uh, uh, certainly they were pathological, sick, something wrong with them, something wrong with their bodies. Um, a lot of the early medical literature in the late 19th and early 20th century um, focused on gender nonconformity as an essential component of sex perversion. Uh, and so talked about mannish women and effeminate men 
as the sort of quintessential emblems of homosexuals uh, and indeed thought that homosexuality was one sign of a more general gender inversion or reversal of one's gender role. And indeed, some doctors went on you know, at a time when good many doctors were arguing that it would be dangerous for a woman to take a job because it might hurt her reproductive capacities, um, were arguing that uh, women who wanted the vote or women who smoke cigars or women who engage in strenuous athletics somehow share the kind of pathology of inversion that um, lesbians did. Uh, in the 1920s, Freudian th theories became, um, began to become more important which saw it less as a bodily issue, uh, some, uh, as homosexuality emerging out of the body and more a psychological struct. And um, Freud's American followers were actually more conservative than Freud himself, but they typically just uh, imagine homosexuality to be a sign of arrested development, uh, that for a variety of reasons, the child's inability to identify with the right parent or some trauma uh, that they didn't go through the full developmental process to become heterosexuals and were stuck in a homosexual stage. Uh, and so this sort of image of homosexuals as immature uh, uh, became very powerful. And uh, then in the, I think in some ways the most dangerous stereotypes for homosexuals really developed between the 1930s and 50s when there were a series of press and police campaigns that um, identified homosexuals as child molesters, um, as um, not just uh, effeminate queens who you might laugh at but had no real reason to fear, but actually as hyper men um, who were unconstrained by women and who threatened um, the nation's children. And this image was really driven home in a series of press campaigns around the country, uh, usually sparked by some particularly awful murder or attack on a child, although almost all of those attacks were men attacking girls. Um, but um, under the theories of the day, that ended up being something that you could lay at the feet of homosexuals. So. Um Did this, how, how did the, the, let me just ask it this way. How did gay people go from being kind of pathetic or amusing or, or something like that, um, or sick, uh, to being frightening? Um, well, there's this sort of intellectual answer to that, or sort of intellectual theory, but I think what maybe, just to keep my answers a little bit briefer, the um, probably the important thing to stress here is the cultural um, process driving this. Uh, Again, a, a series of um, uh, press campaigns um, against uh, um, assault on children, uh, which focused on sex perverts or sex deviates, and the homosexual emerged as the quintessential sex deviant. Uh, and these campaigns took place in cities um, across the country, beginning in the late 30s, and then really with special force in the late 40s and early 50s. Uh, and uh, the national magazine literature chimed in. Um, governments responded to the outcry by the press and the people um, by establishing special commissions to study the problem of what they usually call the deviated criminal sex offender, uh, which came up with recommendations uh, like indeterminate sentencing laws so that someone who was um, uh, convicted of such a, a range of offenses um, was suspected of being a sex deviant, um, could be a sex psychopath, was the term usually used, could be um, committed to psychiatric observation and if determined to be a sex psychopath, committed for an indeterminate sentence so that they would be kept in a um, uh, sort of prison slash mental institution until they'd been cured of their pathology. Um, very, uh, although it was sort of the, the worst kinds of murderers and rapists who were uh, kind of behind the impetus for this. In the end, most DAs didn't want to send those folks to a mental institutions, so they went to prison. And it was typically the more minor offenders who were sent to the mental institutions and quite a lot of homosexuals amongst them. And very quickly, actually, the doctors who were charged with curing them complained that they couldn't cure, quote unquote, cure homosexuals. They couldn't turn them into heterosexuals. Um, so this, uh, and again, this was given the imprimatur of government officials. So this, it's, it's hard to overstate the um, 
the extent of the, the fear um, in the press campaigns and on part of many Americans and, and the way that this really built this image of homosexuals as child molesters. Was there any foundation to the, the charge? Well, again, as I, I've said, in looking at the press coverage, it's really striking that um, most of the stories are actually about men attacking girls. Um, uh, would not appear to be a basis for this charge. Would you take a look for a moment at um, the exhibit that's marked plaintiff's um, 851? It's in the big binder. Uh, Yes. Could you just identify that for the court? Uh, this is an article that I wrote um, called The Post-War Sex Crime Panic. And could you um, look at the page that um, you pointed to me earlier? Um, I think it's 171. And um, you were mentioning the press um, statements about uh, this, you know, perpetuating this idea. Can you read into the record the... Um, press quote that you have referred to? Um, you're referring to the Cornet quote? Yes. Um, sorry, it's, this is a quote from an article published in Coronet magazine in the fall of 1950. Coronet was a very popular family magazine, went into homes all over the country. It published in this issue an article called New Moral Menace to Our Youth. New Moral Menace to Our Youth. Um, and uh, the section of that that I quoted in this article reads, um, once a man assumes the role of homosexual, he often throws off all moral restraints. Some male sex deviants do not stop with infecting their often innocent partners. They descend through perversions to other forms of depravity, such as drug addiction, burglary, sadism, and even murder. How do you interpret that language? Well, um, I think it's... Uh, one, it, it, it's a, a sign of the way that sort of um, moral arguments and psychological arguments about homosexuality were merged here, as they um, often were, so that this is really an argument about uh, depiction of homosexuals as subject to moral decay. Um, so when he throws off all moral restraints, um, once he breaks the bounds and is willing to become homosexual, then he can do anything if he does that, uh, and that they will go on to infect other people. So a sense of, you know, of homosexuality as a disease, not just a randomly contagious disease, but one in which the carriers infect other people with. And this reference to um, infecting their often innocent partners, the term innocent pretty clearly indicates that they're talking about children. Your Honor, I'd like to move exhibit um, 851 into evidence. No objection, Your Honor. 851 will be admitted. I think you mentioned earlier, Dr. Chauncey, that government uh, played a role in uh, perpetuating this idea or in distributing it anyway. Um, I would like you to look at the same exhibit, but this time um, the quote that I think you pointed me to on page 170. Right. Um, this is a statement by um, a special assistant attorney general of California uh, made in 1949 that I've seen reprinted in a number of places. Um, it says, the sex pervert in his more innocuous form is too frequently regarded as merely a queer individual who never hurts anyone but himself. All too often we lose sight of the fact that the homosexual is an inveterate seducer of the young of both sexes and is ever seeking for younger victims. How widely were these kinds, I mean, you mentioned Coronet Magazine, but was this a, a message that was widely circulated? Um, uh, yes, as I, as I said, these, um, I mean, this particular quote uh, I, I've seen reprinted in a number of places, um, but there were media campaigns um, uh, many magazines published articles on this issue, local newspapers did. And I actually think you sort of see in the AG's quote here, um, the Attorney General's quote, uh, this sort of his argument against an older understanding of homosexuals as being relatively innocuous. You might laugh at them or pity them, maybe worry about them, but in fact, 
they are really dangerous and seducers. Did the messages, you know, were they largely addressed to adults or did they also reach the ears of children? Um, well, they were mostly addressed to adults who were, of course, concerned, understandably concerned about the safety of their children and were being taught to believe that homosexuals posed a threat to their children. Uh, but this is also a time when um, school districts in response to uh, the growing concern about this began um, issuing um, brochures to school children, warning them to avoid strangers and that sort of thing. I mean, many the sorts of things that are done today, many of which we would all understand and, and, um, and, and support. Uh, but some of these really um, bred a fear of homosexuals in particular. It's actually a, um, an educational film produced in um, 1961, I think, by a fellow who made a lot of educational films for the California school system called Boys Beware, which was um, uh, really warned boys that they needed to beware homosexuals and homosexuals couldn't be detected and were um, out to oh, and were sick and were out to infect people like them and might um, lead to really very dangerous situations. So again sort of focusing in on the, the danger that homosexuals posed. Dr. Chunce, I want to ask you to look at and read for, from one more exhibit on this topic, and that is um, one we uh, admitted earlier, 2337. It's that U.S. Senate report. Um, and uh, I think you pointed me earlier to page four of that report um, as an example of this. Can you um, find that and read that to the court? Right. Um, right. So the um, the report uh, gave a variety of reasons um, to explain the unsuitability of sex perverts, um, quoting their language, uh, which included their immaturity, instability, um, the the fear that they were liable to blackmail. Um, and uh, so forth and so on. And one of the arguments that they made was that um, they actually could endanger young people working in a government office. Um, so uh, just to quote the paragraph to that effect, most of the authorities agree in our investigation has shown that the presence of a sex pervert in a government agency tends to have a corrosive influence upon his fellow employees. These perverts will frequently attempt to entice normal individuals to engage in perverted practices. This is particularly true in the case of young and impressionable people who might come under the influence of a pervert. Government officials have the responsibility of keeping this type of corrosive influence out of the agencies under their control. It is particularly important that the thousands of young men and women who are brought into federal jobs not be subject, subjected to that type of influence while in the service of the government. One homosexual can pollute a government office. Dr. Chauncey, this is, um, as I think you testified earlier, a Senate subcommittee report for the U.S. Senate. Did it um, influence um, other government agencies? Well, as, as I've said, uh, they encouraged the tightening of procedures to um, regulate, uh, to ferret out and, and dismiss homosexuals, and then in 1950, uh, sorry, 1953, President Eisenhower issued the order banning them um, altogether systematically. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I guess it seems to me that perhaps what's most significant about this is just the, the degree to which it's giving the imprimatur of um, senior government officials to these images of stereotypes of homosexuals. Was there state or I think state legislative action um, in, you know, in light of this sort of attitude of gay people as deviants or perverts? or um, I believe I've, I've talked about that already, but um, both the federal policies uh, and then um, state policies that discriminated against employees. Um, when people were determined to be perverts within the course of this or in, as defined by this kind of report, did they end up in jail? Um, well, they could. Um, I 
to say here. The, uh, I mean, this is again sort of one element of um, uh, a wide range of things that I've discussed, and I've talked about the laws that have been put in place um, prohibiting gay people from assembling in public. Um, bars and restaurants and so forth. Um, in response to the local press campaigns, which then went, really went national periodically in the late 30s and late 40s and early 50s, um, there was a tremendous escalation of the enforcement of those regulations across the country so that there was a tremendous escalation of the number of raids on gay bars, um, on the arrest of gay people, uh, and certainly in New York City, the statistics jumped dramatically um, in the late 40s and early 50s in response to these campaigns. Uh, you know, the, the police felt they needed to show that they were doing something to deal with these problems and um, cracking down on gay bars or interrogating the men who were on the list that they often had developed of homosexuals in the city were, uh, was one way of, of doing that. And so um, people you know, were under much greater risk, and at those moments, many people did avoid going to these meeting places for fear, uh, and it, it could have really life-changing effects on people. I, um, I, I interviewed one person uh, in New York who was a librarian who worked at the New York Public Library, the, the huge Marvel building, uh, Central Library at 42nd Street and Fifth Avenue, and he was arrested in one of these sweeps on a gay-related charge, spent a couple of days in jail. Uh, and he told me the story of how when he returned to work um, after being released from jail, he discovered that his employers had learned that he was gay. And uh, his supervisor met him at the door, marched him down the hall, fired him publicly, had him collect his personal effects and marched him out of the hall. And, and he said that, uh, not only was of course horrifying, the thought that he might lose his career, uh, but that he, um, he was humiliated by having all of his fellow workers who he'd known for years come to the door and watch him be escorted out knowing that he'd been arrested on a homosexual charge. Now, that sort of story happened many times. Um, I want to ask you what you think the most enduring legacy is of the years that these sort of demonic stereotypes um, emerged. Um, on gay people or their place in our country? Well, um, I guess I think there are really two. Um, one is that the, uh, uh, the growing crackdowns, uh, police campaigns against gay life, the federal campaigns, both to oust soldiers and then civilian employees, um, actually led to the start um, of the very earliest gay rights movement or homophile movement as, as it was called in the 40s and 50s. Uh, so small groups of people, there's a small group in New York, but the best known group started in Los Angeles and San Francisco actually started to try to counteract this. Now, of course, they remain very small for years, um, but we, we see the origins of the gay rights movement and the response to the systematic discrimination and demonization. Um, and I guess, on the other hand, I see um, the um, creation and then reinforcement of a series of demonic images of homosexuals that um, uh, stay with us today. And, and so the fear of homosexuals as child molesters or as recruiters uh, continues to have uh, play a role in debates over gay rights and with particular attention to gay teachers, parents, and married couples, people who might have close contact with children. Another area you mentioned in your uh, list of opinions that you were going to give today was that gay people have suffered uh, sustained hostility and prejudice. Um, and I wondered if you would um, give us an example of how uh, hostility and prejudice have affected gay people. Um. Well, uh, one would be the violence that uh, many gay people face. Um, uh, and so a, a general hostility um, towards them uh, and prejudice towards them, which um, 
and, uh, and for many years the sense that the police would do nothing to defend them um, made them liable to violence of various kinds if they were identified as gay. You know, our, our evidence about this is sketchy uh, for the earlier periods, um, but certainly uh, uh, I've heard stories and other historians who've worked on this have been told stories of people being attacked when they were identified as gay. Um, and uh, you know, that we have more recently statistics. The FBI has been collecting hate crime statistics, uh, and they show, I think it, it averages about 1,500 hate crimes a year across the country directed at lesbians and gay men or people perceived to be gay. Um, there have been studies done in some of the big school systems, certainly the California school system. Um, produced uh, research that was uh, analyzed that um, estimated that 200,000 um, students in California's junior high schools and high schools are um, harassed for being gay or perceived to being, being gay every year, um, that a good number of those harassed several times. Uh, so that, uh, and then we've, of course, we're, or, or, uh, many of us are familiar with the most famous examples of this, a handful of incidents that have achieved, have received a lot of media attention. Matthew Shepard's murder uh, in 1998 um, in you know, Laramie where he was met by a couple of guys who drove him out in the country and um, tied him to a post and pistol whipped him and left him to die uh, just a, a year and a half ago or so. Um, Larry Phobes King, uh, um, a 15-year-old student um, in a junior high school here in California who was um, shot in his school's computer lab by and, and, who, and killed by a boy who later explained that um, uh, Larry had said he was attracted to him. Um, so that it's, but that, these are the sort of the very famous examples uh, and then I these studies that show how pervasive it is. And yes, I would say that I, I think more than the policing, the official policing of gay life, it's that fear of vigilante violence that um, really affects the lives of many gay people. When a, when a gay couple walks down the street, um, uh, if they have second thoughts about holding hands, it's not really because they're afraid that the police are going to come out these days and put the handcuffs around them. It's that they're afraid someone who sees them um, could harass them verbally or, or physically. So I think that, that the, the, the scope of that violence is is one of the most powerful um, continuing effects of, of these campaigns of generating prejudice and hostility. I want to ask you to take a look at exhibit, um, plaintiff's exhibit 873 um, and identify that for the court if you would. These are um, hate crime statistics. Um, I presume that these are the hate crime statistics produced by the FBI. They look like that, although it doesn't say on the first page that I have. Um, take a moment to look at yes, it. Yes, right. It yes, appears that the first page is missing, and I'm not quite sure why. but. Yes, but I see here in the introduction, in response to the passage of the Hate Crime Statistics Acts of 1990, the Attorney General designated the FBI's Uniform Crime Reporting Program to develop and implement a data collection system. Um, and if you look at the uh, second page, or the page that's labeled two, um, uh, you see it appears to be dated 1998, or at least it appears to be reporting on crimes in 1998. Yes, uh, 1998. Mm -hmm. And then I'd also like you to look at um, the next exhibit, um, actually, 874, and tell me if you recognize that. Uh, yes, this is a document 
uh, safe place to learn um, consequences of harassment based on actual or perceived sexual orientation and gender nonconformity and steps for making safe uh, schools safer. So this is a document put out by, by the California Safe Schools Coalition about the harassment. And is this the document from which you got that 200,000 yes, figure? Yes, this is. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you recall whether uh, 873 is the document from which you got your um, figure of 1,500 or so? Uh, yes, this does look like that document, yes. Um, Your Honor, I'd like to move those two exits, 873 and 874, into evidence. Your Honor, I don't believe these were disclosed to us on Sunday night um, in the email. I'm not anticipating a problem. Could they be provisionally admitted and then at our next break or in the morning we could clarify that whether we have an objection? That'll be fine. Thank you. And I, I wish I could respond. I know we provided a pretty long list, but it's probably the best way to deal with it. All right. Well, uh, Mr. Um, Thompson's quite properly allowing this matter to be worked out. So how much longer do you have with this witness? Um, Your Honor, I'm going to say about 45 minutes. Okay. Maybe you can pick up the pace. Okay. We'll do. And, and Your Honor, uh, counsel has kindly showed that they did disclose this objection. Very well. Thank you, sir. And sorry, Your Honor, I'll try to keep my answers shorter. <laughs> That's, well, if questions are shorter and the answers are shorter, why, we'll just move it along. <laughs> You described um, anti-gay violence as one example of uh, hostility and prejudice against gay people. Can you give us one more example? Uh, yes. Um, I think that the, that the whole series of um, uh, referendum initiatives we've seen since the mid to late 70s over gay rights um, are another example of continuing prejudice and hostility. Um, Maybe I should step back a second and just try to put, briefly put this in a larger historical context. You know, I, I've described the um, way that rules of secrecy and discussion really govern gay life in response to um, this discrimination and policing. Uh, and part of what happened in the 1970s is that growing numbers of gay people decided to come out. And indeed, the, the gay liberation movements in the 1970s um, shared the feeling of many of the movements of that period of African Americans, Asian Americans, other people, uh, African Americans, Asian Americans, other groups uh, that were searching for dignity as well as rights. Um, and more and more people felt that they really ought to have the rights to be openly gay. Uh, there are a variety of reasons for this. I won't go into those, but that, that really set and stage um, a kind of confrontation as they began advocating f um, both the right to be openly gay and, um, and uh, anti-discrimination legislation to protect them. And then beginning in the 1970s, in the 1970s about 40 towns and cities enacted anti-discrimination um, laws. Uh, another 40 did in the 1980s. Uh, and this very quickly produced a a response. Um, and the most famous early example of that response was a campaign called Save Our Children in Dade County, Miami, Florida in 1977, uh, led by uh, Anita Bryant, a famous Baptist singer, um, uh, which was designed to overturn the local Metro Council's enactment or adding home sexual orientation to the anti-discrimination law. And this um, was a very effective campaign that, um, uh, and its very name, Save Our Children, um, kind of revived, drew on and revived um, these older stereotypes of homosexuals as child molesters um, and uh, led a successful cam campaign to overturn that. And, and this was then inspired a series of campaigns in the late 70s and early 80s and then another major round of campaigns in the late 80s and early 90s so that uh, the figures vary, but let's say in the 20 years after, there were at least 60 of these campaigns, usually to overturn existing gay rights ordinances, um, uh, and about three quarters of which succeeded in doing so. Three quarters of which succeeded in doing and, so? And yes, in overturning the gay rights ordinances. Have you looked at some of the historical records for the Save Our Children campaign? 
Yes, I, I teach about this campaign, and I've looked at some of those records. Would you take a look at Exhibit 1621, Plaintiff's 1621, in your binder? 1621? Yes, I think it's in your smaller binder, actually. Okay. Uh, listed as a material considered. Uh, plaintiffs also provided a supplemental uh, list of materials considered, and I don't believe it was on that either. Your Honor, uh, two things. I think it was on the supplemental, but in any event, Professor Chauncey discussed the Save Our Children campaign at great length in his report and in his deposition and was examined about it extensively. Um, and you know, this is, he, he did rely on a source which was a book that in turn uh, quoted from this document and uh, thought that the court ought to be provided with the original source document. And another reason I think that. But was the document identified to the proponent? It as, was identified, it was. As being used with this witness in his direct examination? Yes. It was? Yes. Yes, Your Honor. We, we would admit it wasn't within 48 hours, but leaving that to the side, uh, they were a little late on that. But the more important point is that under Rule 26, they were obligated to provide us with the documents that he considered in connection with his report so that my deposition could be thoroughgoing on see. this issue. And I did not get this document prior to his deposition. And my records reflect I did not get notice of this until Sunday night. Actually, and there are many documents that fall in this category. If it were just one, I would let it go, but I will be making this objection repeatedly, Your Honor. I don't have that many more documents to introduce, so I'm not quite sure. But, Your Honor, another reason, well, first of all, it was disclosed. It was put on the witness. Well, I understand it was disclosed for uh, the witness's trial testimony, but counsel is saying it was not disclosed in connection with, uh, his dep with the witness's deposition, and therefore Mr. Thompson didn't have an opportunity to examine the witness concerning this document. But, Your Honor, it was, it was discussed in this book, Out for Good, which was um, a source cited in the report and provided the quotes from the document. And furthermore, another reason the court ought to give us a little leeway here, I think, or at least I would request it, um, is that um, the defendant interveners have refused to testify at all about their messaging in this case. And in connection with that, the Ninth Circuit suggested that we have our expert witnesses comment on their messaging. And very shortly, I intend to turn to that. But one way that Dr. Chauncey. Not part of the proponent's message. Well, he's an historian, Your Honor. And so the way it's appropriate for him to comment on messaging is comparative. And so because he did testify in his deposition and was cross-examined about the Save Our Children campaign, and it was that campaign was discussed in the port and quoted from some of these materials. Actually, this document was, in, was quoted in the book and referred to in the report. I don't think there's any prejudice, um, and certainly counsel can fully cross-examine him on it uh, today or tomorrow. If, uh, I gather the book was identified in connection with witnesses, identi uh, witnesses' deposition. Yes, it was, Your Honor. That may be your way of referring to the content, but I'm going to sustain counsel's, uh, counsel's objection. Dr. Chauncey, I'd like to ask you to look at Exhibit 864. Honor, may I approach? Uh, you may. Dr. Chauncey, would you, before we look at this uh, exhibit, would you um, tell the court generally about the themes that were used in the Save Our Children campaign that Anita Bryant uh, led in 1977? Um, yes, when they um, began the campaign, um, their polling data showed that um, there was a margin of support for the anti-discrimination ordinance uh, and that groups that they were worried um, would support it, they needed to persuade. Uh, and so they decided to focus on some of the, what they argued were the consequences of allowing an anti-discrimination law to stand. Uh, and they focused particularly on the effects that this might have on children uh, and they uh, made a, a variety of arguments, but um, uh, two of them were that uh, 
the simple um, tolerance of gay people, or, the, or allowing gay people to be open, particularly if they were teachers or in other positions where they might interact with children, would um, allow them to serve role models, and as role models, that would encourage children to become homosexual themselves. Uh, uh, sort of, there was a presumption here that sexual identity is unstable, that children are easily swayed to homosexuality, uh, and that this would be a real danger. Um, and then they emphasized that point by um, drawing on the stereotypes whose development I've described to argue that homosexuals were child molesters um, and that in effect to um, allow this anti-discrimination ordinance to stand would be to release homosexual predators onto the, the children of Miami. Um, you know, I, you know, Comet also, they, they periodically would sort of say, we're willing to um, tolerate homosexuals um, so long as they don't flaunt their lifestyle, which is basically to say so long as they aren't open about being gay. And so I think you get a sense there of the kind of conflict that was being set up in the 1970s as more gay people were insisting on their right to be openly gay uh, and a pretty clear reaction against that. And was there um, discussion in the campaign materials about um, homosexuals uh, threatening uh, heterosexual people's rights or other people's rights or forcing themselves on people? Well, that's uh, sort of aligned with the, um, the point I just made, this sort of sense that um, to allow gay people to be open, have these rights, would make them a protected class and would uh, sort of force themselves on um, other people simply by being open. Um, Dr. Chauncey, would you take a look at page 303 of um, Exhibit 864, the book Out for Good, and um, look at the bottom of that um, page, the second to last paragraph, and read the language in quotes um, that is ascribed to Anita Bryant in connection with that campaign. Um, she's quoted here as saying, some of the stories I could tell you of child recruitment and child abuse by homosexuals would turn your stomach. I'm sorry. Um, some of the stories I could tell you of child recruitment and child abuse by homosexuals would turn your stomach. Could you also quote from the newspaper advertisement um, that's quoted further down in that paragraph? This recruitment of our children is absolutely necessary for the survival and growth of homosexuality. For since homosexuals cannot reproduce, they must recruit, must freshen their ranks. And who qualifies as a likely recruit? A 35-year-old father or mother of, or, or mother or two? Sorry. Who serves qualifies as a likely recruit? A 35-year-old father or mother of two? Or a teenage boy or girl who is struggling, uh, surging with sexual awareness? After um, you testified in deposition in this case, um, did you request that we seek uh, to find the original article that you just quoted from? Uh, yes. And is that what um, exhibit, the exhibit that was not admitted is? I will have to check the footnotes to confirm that, but I believe that's the case. Your Honor, while the witness is confirming that, I would like to offer um, exhibit 1621 for judicial notice. Um, even There's no question about the authenticity of the document, or at least that's what we've been told. Um, and so I would request that the court take judicial notice of the document. We have no Very well. Uh, Dr. Chauncey, just to make it easier, if you look at 16. Uh, yes, uh, this, uh, the quote I read you from the newspaper is from the um, article. Uh, would, would you take a look as well at the, uh, I'm sorry, going back to uh, Out for Good, the um, Exhibit 864, the top of page 304, and uh, read the uh, material quoted from uh, the Miami uh, Herald advertisement that's at that part of the book. Okay, so this is from an ad uh, in place. Uh, it reads, there's no human right to corrupt our children. Many parents are confused uh, and don't know the real dangers posed by many homosexuals and perceive them as all being gentle, non-aggressive types. 
The other side of the homosexual coin is a hair-raising pattern of recruitment and outright seduction and molestation, a growing pattern that predictably will intensify if society approves laws granting legitimacy to the sexually perverted. And Dr. Chauncey, would you turn to page 306 of Out for Good and um, read the language quoted from Anita Bryant uh, in the bottom paragraph about the middle of that paragraph. Well, actually, yes. It begins, uh, homosexuality is a conduct. Homosexuality is a conduct, a choice, a way of life. And if you choose to have a lifestyle as such, then you're going to have to live with the consequences. It's not a sickness, but a sin. Last, Dr. Chauncey, would you take a look at uh, page 308 of Out for Good and um, take a look at the bottom of that page and read the language that Anita Bryan is quoted as saying uh, in her written victory statement to her audience. Uh, she's quoted as saying, tonight the laws of God and the cultural values of man have been vindicated. I thank God for the strength he has given me, and I thank my fellow citizens who joined me in what at first was a walk through the wilderness. The people of Dade County, the normal majority, have said enough, enough, enough. They have voted to repeal an obnoxious assault on our moral values, despite our community's reputation as one of the most liberal areas in the country. Professor Chauncey, did the Save Our Children campaign have an impact outside Dade County, Florida? Uh, yes, the, the success of the campaign um, inspired other groups uh, around the country to start um, referendum campaigns to um, revoke anti-discrimination laws uh, bearing on homosexuality. Uh, there were a series of campaigns, um, St. Paul, Eugene, California, uh, in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, uh, two of them were unsuccessful, uh, one the Briggs Initiative here in California, one in Seattle, and the others passed. Um, uh, and then um, as I think I said before, uh, over the, the next 20 years or so, uh, there were um, dozens of such campaigns designed primarily to overturn um, uh, such anti-discrimination laws, but uh, sometimes to engage in other, um, to in other ways restrict um, uh, homosexuals. Um, and Professor Chauncey, when we started today, you expressed your expert opinion that the history of discrimination that you've recounted has had continuing effects today. And I want to wrap up by talking a little bit about the Proposition 8 campaign. Are you familiar with the initiative called Proposition 8? I am. And how do you understand the purpose and effect of Proposition 8? It was a proposed uh, a vote on a um, proposed amendment to the California Constitution. Uh, which would have restricted uh, marriage to a man and a woman. Uh, and it was put on the ballot in response to the California State Supreme Court's decision that uh, gay couples did have marriage rights. Uh, and it passed uh, and um, did take those rights away. And is this Proposition 8, this measure, representative of the history that you've described of a large number of direct democracy campaigns um, that are hostile to gay people? Uh, I do think as a historian that the, the wave of campaigns that we've seen um, against uh, gay marriage rights in the last um, decade are in effect the, the latest stage and a cycle of um, anti-gay rights campaigns of a sort that I've been describing, uh, that they continue with a similar intent and um, uh, use some of the same imagery. Yes, and have you reviewed some of the materials that advocated the passage of Prop 8? Uh, uh, I have. And do you believe that some of the stereotyped images of gay people that you've described today can be seen in those materials? Uh, I do. And uh, is one of the things that you reviewed today the official voter guide? Yes, I did review that. Um, I'm going to ask you to read a few passages from that. Would you turn to Plaintiff's Exhibit 1, which I believe is in your skinny binder? Uh, it's here. Yes. And if you would turn to the um, 
argument in favor. Exhibit one is in evidence, isn't it? Yes, it is, Your Honor. The argument in favor of Proposition 8 on, well, the page is marked 56, I think, of the ballot pamphlet. Right. It would have been 56 from the voter guide. Could you start by reading the text of the seventh paragraph that begins, it protects our children? It's the paragraph after the it overturns. It protects our children from being taught in public schools that, sorry, I'll go more slowly. It protects our children from being taught in public schools that same-sex marriage is the same as traditional marriage. Would you also now read the first full paragraph in the right-hand column that begins, we should not accept? Okay. I'd actually like to read the next paragraph, the following one I just read. Okay. Proposition 8 protects marriage as an essential institution of society. While death, divorce, or other circumstances may prevent the ideal, the best situation for a child is to be raised by a married mother and father. Then to go to the passage you mentioned, we should not accept the court decision that may result in public schools teaching our kids that gay marriage is okay. That is an issue for parents to discuss with their children according to their own values and beliefs. It shouldn't be forced on us against our will. And then would you read the passage, the second sentence of the paragraph after the one you just read? However, while gays have the right to their private lives. I'm sorry. The sentence immediately above that. Okay. Proposition 8 does not take away any of those rights and does not interfere with gays living the lifestyle they choose. And then read the sentence you were about to read. However, while gays have the right to their private lives, they do not have the right to redefine marriage for everyone else. Could you explain how you believe the messages in these arguments reflect the stereotypes whose historical origins you've already discussed today? Well, I think in part they certainly are premised on the notion of the inferiority of gay people, gay people in their relationships. So to argue that the best situation for a child is to be raised by a married mother and father is to argue that a married heterosexual couple is superior to a gay couple. So it really continues the long history that I've described, which has presumed the inferiority of gay people. And then it focuses on children, again, not calling them child molesters, gay people, child molesters, and so forth, but warning that we should not teach our kids that gay marriage is okay, that it shouldn't be forced on us against our will, and in fact that we should not be told that gay marriage, in effect gay equality, which I think is linked to the openness of gay people and their call for the full recognition of their rights that other people enjoy, their right to be public in their relationships, that we shouldn't have to expose our kids to that. And this sort of image, it shouldn't be forced on us against our will, kind of evokes the fears of the aggressiveness of the sexuals and this idea that they do not have the rights to, however while gays have the right to their private lives, they do not have the right to redefine marriage for everyone else. Again, they have the right to do what they want on their own, just don't make us take note of it. And so their rights to be open about who they are and about their relationships is less important than our rights to not have to recognize them. And in that voter guide in several places uses the language protects our children. How do you interpret that language? Well, you have to ask the question protects against what, and it evokes for me the language of saving our children, the need to protect children from exposure to homosexuality, not just from exposure to homosexuals as presumed child molesters, but protecting them from exposure to the idea of openly gay people. I'd like to ask you to look now at the 
Let me, let me do this. Professor Chauncey, have you reviewed any of the television ads that were broadcast in California in support of Proposition 8? Uh, I have. Do you believe the messages in those campaign ads reflect the stereotypes whose, uh, whose history you've described? Um, I, I think they do. I mean, they're certainly um, uh, more polite uh, than um, the, the ads that um, Anita Bryant uh, used 30 years ago. Uh, it's a sign, I think, of how um, uh, the place of gay people in American society has changed and what one can say in polite society about gay people has changed. Uh, but I guess I was especially struck by, I, I think those ads in general um, focus, that what they're focused on protecting our children, um, the concern about um, uh, people of faith, uh, religious institutions somehow being harmed by um, the recognition of gay marriage are, are in them. But what I suppose is most striking to me is the image of the little girl who comes in to um, uh, tell her mom in, in the kitchen that that day she'd read a book in school called King and King, uh, and she learned that a prince can marry a prince, and maybe I can marry a princess. And so here I think you've got a pretty strong echo of this idea that um, the simple exposure to um, uh, gay people and their relationships uh, is going to somehow lead a generation of young kids to become gay. Your Honor, I'd like to show some of the short video ads, the ones that are marked, exhibits 29, 99, 91, 15, and 16. I believe, uh, I'm not sure which ones are, that's a good question. Um, Your Honor, uh, I will offer in evidence the, all five of them to the extent they're not already admitted. I think one or two of them may already have been admitted yesterday. Under a 99 and 15 are in, Your Honor. Under a different number? No, same number. Uh, same number? Yes. All right. So 15 and 91 are in. 99, sorry, Your Honor. 99, I'm sorry. And you're offering? Uh, 29, 91, and 16. There no objection. Uh, Your Honor, we don't anticipate any objection, but could we just see the ads and then we'll say no objection once we've seen them? That would be fine with me, Your Honor. wide open now. It's going to happen whether you like it or not. Four judges ignored four million voters and imposed same-sex marriage on California. It's no longer about tolerance. Acceptance of gay marriage is now mandatory. That changes a lot of things. People sued over personal beliefs. Churches could lose their tax exemption. Gay marriage taught in public schools. We don't have to accept this. Whether you like it or not. Yes on eight. Mom, guess what I learned in school today? What, sweetie? I learned how a prince married a prince, and I can marry a princess. Think it can happen? It's already happened. When Massachusetts legalized gay marriage, schools began teaching second graders that boys can marry boys. The courts ruled parents had no right to object. Under California law, public schools instruct kids about marriage. Teaching children about gay marriage will happen here unless we pass Proposition 8. Yes on 8. Some say that gay marriage doesn't have anything to do with schools. But it has everything to do with schools. After Massachusetts legalized gay marriage, our son came home and told us the school taught him that boys can marry other boys. He's in second grade. We tried to stop public schools from teaching children about gay marriage, but the court said we had no right to object or pull him out of class. It's already happened in Massachusetts. Gay marriage will be taught in our schools unless we vote yes on Proposition 8. 
Opponents of Prop 8 said gay marriage has nothing to do with schools. Then a public school took first graders to lesbian wedding, calling it a teachable moment. Now this politician says schools aren't required to teach about marriage. Yet his official website confirms teaching marriage is required in 96% of schools. And a leading Prop 8 opponent has warned parents cannot remove children from this instruction. Unless we vote yes on Proposition 8, children will be taught about gay marriage. Whether you like it or not. Same-sex marriage. Have you really thought about it? What it means when gay marriage conflicts with our religious freedoms. Why it was forced on us by San Francisco judges when gay domestic partners already have the same legal rights. What it means when our children are taught about it in school. Have you thought about what same-sex marriage means? To me? Think about it. Voting yes restores traditional marriage. Yes on Proposition 8. Your Honor, having seen the videos, we have no objection to their video. Very well. 15, 16, 29, 91, and, well, I think those four. Dr. Chauncey. Are admitted. Oh, Your Honor. Um, what are some of the key messages being communicated these in these ads that you think reflect the history of discrimination you've discussed with us today? Um, well, uh, again, uh, the sense that um, uh, the inequality of gay people and their relationships, um, that marriage will convey equal status to um, gay people and their relationships. Uh, the fear of something being forced on people, which certainly animated many of the um, referendum campaigns that I've uh, mentioned, designed to put to popular vote, popular resistance to uh, something being imposed on them by um, legislators for the courts. And this focus on children, I think, is the most striking thing, um, that we have to protect our children from exposure to the idea of um, gay marriage, which is a sign of the um, full equality of gay people and of um, our recognition of, of them. And certainly the implication, as I've said in that ad, that such exposure could actually lead children who have unstable sexual identities to um, become gay. I'd like to and just the, ask. The fear of that. Oh, I mean, they're clearly the underlying message here is uh, some of, uh, something about the um, uh, the undesirability of homosexuality that we don't want our children to become this way. Thank you. Um, I'd like to just quickly have you um, look at two print ads, and then we will be about ready to wrap this up. Um, I'd like you to look at exhibits um, 17. 1763, which I, I'm hoping our tech people can put on the screen. Uh, Your Honor, we object to Dr. Chauncey testifying to this document. We do not object to its being evidence, but uh, this was not disclosed in his expert report. Exhibit 1763. Mr. Your Honor. It's correct that it was not. Um, he had not yet seen it at the time. We were still getting discovery from the plaintiffs at that time. And so much of the written material, I can't say for certain that this one came before or after, but the material we were getting from the plaintiffs was coming in quite late. Uh, Your Honor, I can say definitively, and this was in the first production well before the expert report was due on October 2nd. Look, the objection is this was not uh, disclosed at the time the witness was deposed? Yes, Your Honor, and it would violate Rule 26 when he, when this was in possession of the plaintiffs before his report was due for him then to come into court now and for the first time offer his opinions on it. Your Honor, um, if I might, again, the Ninth Circuit indicated um, quite late, that is in December, and its decision wasn't even final until January 4th, that we should use our experts to talk about messaging. Um, these are two exhibits. Um, I'm just about done here, but I think that because the delay in the plaintiffs producing their evidence and their refusal to talk about them led the, to the um, understanding that we would need experts solely to comment on the messaging, or at least it would be unlikely we would be able to get the plaintiffs to comment on, on them. When did, this, excuse me, when did this particular document come into your possession? Um, that I don't know, Your Honor, because the volume came at us um, 
fast and furious, but maybe one of my colleagues can answer the question. It was in the first production. What about the uh, 1770? When was that first production? Your Honor, I know this. <clears throat> the second production was September 18th, so I know it was before September 18th, and the expert reports were due on October 2nd. And I, and I would further add, Your Honor, that they did a supplemental production of materials considered, and this was not part of it. So this is totally the first time that we, uh, other than on Sunday night when we got the laundry list of documents, that we had any idea that Professor Chauncey was going to testify about this. Well, this is a little different in that this is a document that appears to have been produced by your client. Yes, Your Honor, but I... No. It's, uh, it's unlike the Miami Herald uh, article of 1977. <laughs> Your Honor, I, I've known about this document. We're, we're proud of this document. We don't have a problem with, with it being admitted into evidence. What we do have a problem with is under Rule 26, a witness coming in, never having disclosed it in his expert report, never having given any indication in the report he would opine on it, my not being able to depose him on it, and now he comes in, uh, you know, trying to uh, speak to it. Your Honor, it's not deep. Uh, Professor Chauncey discussed at length in his report and in his deposition the messaging. This, these are both simple documents, um, simple message, and, um, you know, I, it's going to take less than a minute probably to get through this testimony. I don't I'm think sure they're prejudiced. That's an argument for getting it in, but um, in as much as this is a document of uh, the defendant interveners, uh, and in view of your description, and I think an accurate one, of the Ninth Circuit's uh, initial um, holding with respect to the scope of expert testimony, I think since the document is coming in, since it is a document of the pr proponents, that it's not unfair to permit the witness to testify uh, about it and his conclusions concerning the document. And so the objection will be overruled with respect to 1763. And, Your Honor, can the 1775 is similar, although I think it may have been produced later. Same circumstances? Uh, Your Honor, uh, there are the same circumstances, but I won't repeat my objection. But we do have an issue about authenticity, which we may be able to resolve, and we would be willing to let it come in provisionally. But this is a photocopy, and I have no idea whether this is actually a protect marriage. You can see from the quality of it, it could have been digitally altered. It's not like the first document, which is one right. of ours. Subject to an authenticity uh, objection, then you may proceed with 1775 and 17. 63 will be admitted. Dr. Chauncey, if you could just look at 1775 and... Or 74? Five. Five. 